Welcome back. Now, this is part six of our journey into the coupled oscillations, and we are going to spend this screencast on the loaded string. So what's the loaded string? Well, it's essentially shown in this picture here. Uh, in this picture, we have a string, a one-dimensional string. It's uh, clamped on both ends, uh, so attached to uh, uh, fixed walls. And um, that string, uh, you have to think a little bit about that string um, which is massless, but we add a little ma masses, small masses, m a distance d apart from one another. So the total length is n plus one times d, and we have um, so we have those those uh, th those masses that are that are located there. So essentially, we want to know uh, if we represent the interaction between the masses as springs, so a quadratic form. Uh, we want to know what are the vibration in this system and the transverse oscillation. To give you um, an idea, transverse oscillation from a string like this it would be uh, the sound that would come from a guitar string or from a from a from, from a violin. So any of things of this would correspond to, to to this problem here. So we are going to describe this using the same formalism as we've done for the other part of this uh, series. And first of all, we are going to focus on the three consecutive masses anywhere along the string. Um, and so we are going to use the generalized coordinate QJ. And for the mass J is uh, on each side, is flanked on each side by a mass J minus one and a mass J plus one. Uh, this deformation here is a transfer, transverse deformation, right? Perpendicular to the, to the, to the strings when it's at equilibrium. And we are interested in knowing how we can write the, the potential of this. So we do the usual, uh, make the usual assumption that uh, the Qs are small and uh, we have small displacement. And if we do that, we are not deforming significantly the, the rope. And so the tension in the rope is, is a constant as well. So that means that we can use very much the same approach as we use for carbon dioxide on the previous screencast where we actually look at the angle that's formed transversely in the string. And so this angle is supposed to be, th those angles are supposed to be very small simply because we have very small displacement. So the, of course the QJ and QJ minus one and plus one on the figure actually are, are exaggerated a little bit probably uh, to be beyond this, uh, this level of approximation. So the, we can again look at the angles and, and, and decide that uh, uh, the, the force along x, uh, sorry, the force, the vertical force, which would be along, along y, I suppose, but we are going to use x and y anyway since we are using the q's. Um, so the force is going simply going to be given by, by the, the projection, if you will, of the difference qj and qj minus 1 on the direction of, of motion. And so that gives us this formula. Actually, this formula is exactly the same as the one we use for carbon dioxide to look at the transverse mode. So this might be a good place to pause the screencast and make sure that you that you see that you agree with this this force. Uh, it's it's essentially the projection of the tension in the in the rope. So tau tau is a projection. That projection will actually involve a sine. Which is a cosine, but the sine of the complementary, the cosine of complementary, so the sine, and that is what you would get. Then we can write Newton's second law uh, for the particle J, and when we do that, we have the, the the acceleration equal to the force divided by the mass. This is a very very typical thing to do. Um, this uh, and this equation actually it's it's uh, usually called the nearest neighbor interaction because well you only interact with the first neighbor. So qj does not interact, at least not directly, with qj plus 1 or qj minus qj, uh, qj plus 2 or qj minus 2. So we could actually write a more uh, sophisticated model where a mass would interact with the next neighbor and so on and so forth. And we could treat it the same way as we are going to do here. But this is the simplest approximation we can use. So this is the equation we have. Um, here I use Newton's law in this screencast to, to find the equation. Obviously we could do the same using uh, the Lagrange 
mechanics to get to get the equation of motion. Uh, in fact, in the textbook that we use for as a reference for this screencast, um, it's uh, it's they use both. So if you are curious, I invite you to go in the to go check in the in the textbook. But the point is that you get the equation of motion, and it's yet another example that Newton's uh, dynamics and Lagrangian dynamics are actually the same, <laughs> gives the same answer, which is um, good, I would say. So usual trick here, we are lo looking for an oscillatory solution. Um, and um, so we are going to try a general solution like this, with the AJ being uh, complex numbers. Uh, and so we try that, we inject that solution inside uh, the equation. And, and I, I like to, to maybe to, to revisit a little bit when I say we try that. Well, we, we are looking for an oscillatory solution. So we try to see if an oscillatory solution is indeed a solution. And usually what happens, and we kind of forgot this, is that, yes, it is a solution, therefore you can move on. So <laughs> that, that little piece saying that, yes, these are solutions, uh, is important, in, of course, in the description. But the point is, this uh, particular substitution that we have done so many times in this chapter allows us to transform a differential equation like the one that's shown in the title of this slide, into an algebraic equation. And this is the one that, I, that we show here. Now, this equation is true for, for every j's, right? Because it came from the acceleration of j's. One thing, that, one thing to realize is that, of course, we have boundary conditions. We are clamping the two ends. So A0, so the, so the, 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 the leftmost mass, and A n plus 1, the rightmost mass, are fixed. So I'd like I, so, so fixed being, being mean that there is no amplitude. So if the amplitude is zero, that's what a naught equal a n plus one equals zero means. I, I like to just so we avoid any confusion, easy confusion, is that when we talk about a chain, let's say we say n equal three. Well, when we say n equal three, we really mean n equal f n prime equal five. We have five. When we say n equal three, we mean three moving masses. Okay, just so it's clear when we make an we do look at an example later. So this is the equation I have to, to solve. Again, same old song is that we have n such equations, right, for j going from 1 to n. And in order for this equation to be compatible, we need to have the secular determinant to be 0. And of course, we can write it uh, the usual way. Um, we have put dots here in the determinant because n can be any value. But if we describe uh, lambda as equal to 2 tau over d minus m omega square, by the way, tau is the tension in the, in the rope and um, in the string, and d is the distance between each of the masses, then we find that we have this determinant that can actually be calculated. In fact, this determinant can be calculated using, uh, using different techniques of the fact that we just have off-diagonal uh, um, term, and it's, it's actually possible to do it this evening using sparse algebra or, or things like this. Uh, so this is actually not very difficult to do numerically uh, or even mathematically, uh, so long as n is finite. So we can have a look at different solutions. For example, if n is equal 1, so remember one n equal 1 means only one uh, mass is moving. And if one mass is moving, we see one transverse mode and one longitudinal mode, um, where in one case the tension in the rope is what matters, in the other case is kappa, which is the effective uh, force constant. For n equal 2, right, for n equal 2, which is actually an example we already looked at, n equal 2 means two masses that are uh, connected to two strings that are fixed, uh, that are themselves connected to fixed walls, and then a, a string between them. Um, so this is ex this example here, n, n equal 2, is exactly the example we looked at uh, at the very first screencast of this series. So, but we find obviously the same answers. Uh, we find the two, uh, two solutions that we, that we were expecting uh, to get. Okay, now let's try to have a look at uh, the general case for n particles. And for this, we are again going to try to, to, to find a way to find a solution. Uh, it's not, you know, if we could diagonalize easily, of a, I mean, get the determinant, calculate the determinant easily, uh, for any value of n, we would find a solution, but we don't usually can. We, we cannot, you usually can't, sorry. Um, and so what we, what we do, we are going to try to have a solution of this shape. So you remember the AJ are the terms that are in front of EI omega T. 
We are going to find a solution of this type where A in this case is a real number since we are putting explicitly the, the, the phase delta and we are just going to try to do something. So the, uh, this is for, for notations the i and the exponential is the usual square root minus one j, gamma, and delta j uh, are just uh, numbers, j is an is a integer, it's just the index of aj. And we are, again, we are going to try this solution. Once again, we try the solution, do we get to an impasse or do we get a result? It's what happens. So what happens is actually it works. So we can substitute in the algebraic solution and uh, algebraic equation and then we find something like this. Well, you probably, uh, we probably have a keen eye and seeing that we find E minus I omega uh, gamma minus, uh, plus E I gamma. So that's very nice because that, of course, shows me that oh, we can find omega square. Uh, we can find omega square. And then, of course, we see that uh, the, we have the orders relationship uh, replacing the cosine omega, uh, sorry, cosine gamma. And... Uh, 1 minus cosine gamma is obviously the square of the half uh, angle. No, this is, I mean, twice that. Um, it's, of course, uh, simple trigonometry. The point is that we can, we, we, this is a very nice way to say, to give a relationship between the frequency of the mode and the gamma uh, of the mode. So again, gamma, look at the title of this slide. This is, this is actually a very important number to describe the actual coefficients of the of the normal mode, so that's very nice. Uh, so we can find we see that uh, the omega r will be the square root of that number, so that will be two square root two t tau of m d sine omega r. So now we can we can endow an index r to the uh, to the gamma to the gamma uh, factor. So that's uh, that's good because now we can actually write these things a little bit nicer. Uh, and then uh, we, we, we're not there then yet, but let's do one more step. Let's have one more step here. Uh, because what we have not done yet is to impose the boundary conditions. So now we can actually impose the boundary conditions. And the boundary conditions, which is that a naught and a n plus 1 is equal, at equal to 0, are going to impose the value of gamma. And actually, that's what we're going to see now. So remember, these are the coefficients we want. What really matters to us is the real part. I'm not going to repeat again what I said in the previous section, but in, in, ther in a classical mechanics, we are interested in the real part of the solution. We only use the complex version, I mean, the, the, the complex version so that it makes the math easier. Okay, so I just repeated what I said in previous screencast, but it's fine. Um, so we have two boundary conditions. The boundary condition, one of them is at j equals zero, right at the leftmost part for every single mode. At j equals zero, um, a zero, is, it has to be equal to zero. And that means that um, if j equals, for, for uh, uh, j equals zero, the fact that things has to be, have to be equal to zero impose that delta r b pi over two. Once again, it's probably a good idea to stop the screencast and convince yourself of that. But uh, the only way for the sign to become zero at j equals zero is for the, the pi for the, the phase factor to be to be pi over two. What does that mean? Again, remember what I told you about the phase factor delta before in other screencasts as well. It actually tells you where the origin is located. So what this is saying is basically because of the boundary condition that a0 has to be equal to 0, the, those coefficients have to be a sine function. And because sine function is a function that starts at 0, okay? So that's why the cosine is okay so long as we shift it by pi over 2, right? That is the, the usual trick. Now we have the value of delta, wonderful, it's pi over 2. Now we still need the value of gamma, and ga the value of gamma r is going to be obtained by imposing the boundary condition at the la at the end of the, the rope at the end of the string, and so that that's going to be given by the fact that we want the, the coefficients to be also zero at j equal n plus one, and then we end up with the sine function for, that we just derived, and find that the only way for this to be true is for n plus one times gamma r to be uh, integer number of pi 
This is the only way for this to happen. So those boundary conditions really, really impose the values on gamma. And as a result, they also impose a value on the frequency, because remember, the frequency was actually related to the sine of gamma. So that's very cool, because now we have all the solutions that we need. And uh, we have everything we need. We have the gammas, we have the omegas, and, this, and the final solution that we will have uh, for any QJ will be obtained by this result, which again, um, can now be described a bit more because this equation is the general equation that's always true. Uh, but now we know what the AJR uh, is, uh, uh, AJRs are, <laughs> and uh, this is just the sign that we just obtained. And uh, we can rearrange things a little bit so that we make things a little bit simpler. But this is a very important result. And let's try to understand a little bit uh, why this is an important result. Uh, this is a very important result because, look, uh, the index J is the index showing the different uh, the displacement of atom J. R is a number that goes from, in principle, 1 to N, since we have N mode. But it's actually very interesting to look at what happens if, um, what happens if, if R is, big, is larger. And this is actually going to become important. So, here, we plotted a few results for n equal 3. Uh, so again, these are three moving um, masses. And the point is, what we say is that for n equal 3, we have three transverse mode. And we want to, and uh, let's see if it's true. Well, it turns out that the first three transverse mode are r equal 1, 2, and 3. If you look at, at uh, r equal 4, you will see from the sign that you have four uh, you're going to have uh, 4 pi over 4, so you're going to have a sine of j times pi, which is obviously always 0. This is called a null mode. So the modes that are shown in green on this slide are null modes. Now let's imagine that r goes bigger. Well, if r goes bigger, like for example r equal 5 in the, in, the, in the red box on the top right, you see that the displacement are just the minus of the displacement of r equal 3. Well, the, the, the overall phase does not matter, obviously, in this case. It's just a matter of when you start the time. And it turns out that what's very interesting is that if you have a larger R, uh, you, the, the A's, you know, the A values that were the sine J times R pi of an N plus 1, these, are, of course, have more oscillations. However, the, oscilla the, the value of the oscillation only matter, so the values only matter, where we have masses. So if we compare the two red uh, boxes, they're actually the same solution, even though the A's actually, um, actually oscillate much more. And you can see that it's a general treatment. So the blue box, they also correspond to the same system. There's just a phase factor of, of, of minus one, which is just a matter of when you start the, 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 the measurement, I mean, the calculation. There are many more oscillations, but the motions are exactly the same because the only part that matters is where there is a mass, and same for r equal 7 compared to r equal 1. So you see, the point is that it explains why uh, we only have a certain number of modes, and the sign, we could, you could think that the r index could keep growing and growing, but as it grows, you end up with the same solution. So that's actually something very important, especially for people looking at vibrations into, uh, in solids, uh, and uh, what's called phonons, we are, which we are not going to talk about, but uh, that's actually a very interesting uh, field of research. So we have a couple more things to do in this screencast. Is uh, now that we found the solution, is to write the normal coordinates, uh, and the normal coordinates are actually obtained by the usual the usual thing, right? Beta r e to the power i omega r t. And then we can write the general solution, as always, as a linear combination of the normal coordinates eta r times the aj. Remember the aj, that's the usual, the usual solution, and we just found the, the aj at the sine function. So I do understand that if it's the first time you actually study this, it may seem like a lot, it may seem a bit overwhelming with all the indices and so on and so forth. I really invite you to take a deep breath and try slowly to convince yourself if you keep track of the different variables and, and, and uh, signification of them, you will see that there is actually nothing very complicated in this. Now, 
we can do something a little bit further because we do have more information. Uh, we could actually write <clears throat> we could actually write the QJ um, explicitly now by reinserting the beta R E R to the power omega R T, and B, beta R is a complex number, so it's mu R plus I nu R. <clears throat> And if I do this, actually, I, I can collect just the real part uh, of, for QJ. And when I do that, I can rewrite the full equation of QJ with the coefficient mu s and nu s. OK, I have to confess that here I did not, I decided, I made the, the decision not to, to prove to you what the mu s and nu s are. The reason I did this is because this is essentially an elementary calculation that's actually done in the textbook, which I invite you to look at. And we, but we do not learn more physics, so you use more physics. The point is, and I and I really ask you to do it as an exercise if you if you want to do so, is that we can express any solution QJT um, as a so long as we know the initial condition QJ0 and QJ.0. So the initial condition on the position and initial condition on the velocity. By the way, it's not surprising we need two types of, of, bundle, of initial conditions since we have a second order differential equation with the equation of motion. So what's more important though is to apply this equation in the, in the red box, in the, in the black box. And let's do that for n equal three. So imagine you have n equal three, you have this situation with three moving masses and you decide to pluck, to take one of the mass uh, and to displace it by a value of a. While you don't play, displace anything else and you do not give an initial velocity. So mathematically, you translate that into this, right? The second, the central, the central um, atom, which is, Q, which is j equal to, is displayed by a value of a, and all the others are unmoved, and they are, everything is at rest. Then you let it go. You let it go, and so all the velocities are zero, so the coefficients nu s from the previous side are obviously zero, since they depend on qj dot at zero. The other coefficients are not zero, the mu s, they are given by this formula, which I just showed you. Uh, but uh, most of the qj zero are zero, aside from q2, which is equal to a. So you find that uh, the only surviving term in the sum is j equal to two, and you end up with this equation when n equal three. So that's an interesting thing because as you know, r goes from one to three, uh, because n equal three. And uh, you can actually calculate now the mu, the different mu s, so the mu one, mu two, mu three, and you find these results. So these results are actually telling you how much of each coefficient co um, um, going to, is going to contribute to, to, to the dynamics and how they contribute. So essentially, if you, re if you remember how we write the general solution like this, now that we know the, the mu r and the nu r, uh, of course, the nu r all zero, we can actually rewrite all the solution q1, q2, q3 for everything. So here on this slide, and, and, and we know also the frequency, of course, when on this slide, what's, what's, really, what's really cool is that you can solve exactly the dynamics of how your system is behaving as you pluck the central atom and then you let it go and this is how the system is going to evolve. And as you know, because we have only conservative forces, it's going to keep doing this forever. So I strongly recommend that you try to plot this and in fact there will be the opportunity to, uh, to have a bonus, uh, some bonus points uh, by solving one problem like this. So in any case, I hope that this was clear to you and the screencast was useful for you to understand how, uh, those, uh, how, the, how this, uh, the physics of the loaded string matters. What we will do in the next screencast, we are actually going to uh, make uh, the number of masses infinite and infinitely close to one another. So in other words, we are going to actually look at the uh, an, uh, a string, how a string vibrates when we suppose a string has a, a finite mass and a constant density. So, but that's, uh, you're going to have to be patient because that will be in the next screencast. Thank you very much.